Okay, today I'm going to talk about the first four Pink Floyd albums, which I think make up the greatest music that they ever did. And I'm certainly not uh, arguing that that's the only good music they did. I know you have a lot of people who argue that the Sid Barrett stuff is something just amazing and miraculous that happened. And then once Roger Waters took over, they got worse and worse and worse. I certainly don't think that's the case. I, I, I think I'll uh, make a good case that they... Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, even the Final Cut, all great albums in the later part, all the middle section of their career. I do have a problem with Adam Hart, Mother, and most some of Metal, not all of Metal, but I think uh, that was a period of transition there, although the band have actually said, David Gilmore has actually said that Amagama, which I'm going to praise uh, as being a great album, he, he thinks that's the time when they lost their way. Um, and certainly it's one of the great changes where a band loses their lead singer, their formative uh, sort of songwriting genius at the beginning and has managed to switch over to another singer, songwriter. It's quite unique. I, I, ACDC, obviously, another band who managed to pull off that trick. But ACDC did it right in the middle of their career. So Pink Floyd, it really happened very early on. It's remarkable how quickly Sid Barrett his whole career was over as far as Pink Floyd. And I will talk about the two solo albums in another post that Sid Barrett did, which I also think are very good. But um, for all extent purposes, uh, 19, the end of 1967, he was out. So he was really that band. All the first two singles and the first album were, were 1967 and, and then Jugland Blues, which is on the second album. Uh, David Gilmore pretty much taken over the, his part as being the front man in the band by that time. So anyway, on vinyl, I have the first two albums in this great double pack called A Nice Pair, which has an amazing cover there. Some great photos. Um, again, that's how I came across these first two albums, but the official covers, which I have on CD, there's a great psychedelic cover there, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and a saucer full of secrets we've got there, which also very psychedelic looking cover. And I also put into that these two singles. So the first single, Arnold Lane, which Candy in the Current Bun is the B-side, and then we have C. Emily Play with Scarecrow on this as a B-side. So let's begin with that, those first two albums and those first two singles. Now, I think uh, it's a remarkable music making on those albums, uh, just for the sheer innovation. So the instrumentation, the production, the lyrical content, the, the singing, the backing harmonies, the keyboards, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'm going to be specific. So I'm going to talk about first, I guess, the single. So Arnold Lane had a different producer. I think it was uh, Joe Boyd, if I'm correct. Uh, someone will pick me up if I'm not. But it certainly wasn't Norman Smith. So Norman Smith did the production on Piper of the Gates of Dawn, and he was a producer or an engineer for the Beatles. So they were also recording this album pretty much next door to the Beatles, recording Sgt. Pepper's at the same time. So that's an incredible thing. So the, the, the sound, uh, the, the innovation obviously on both those albums is remarkable and I would argue that uh, they both suffer in some, in some way, very small way, from having these two great singles before the album came out. Now George Martin did say that he w lamented the fact that um, Sgt Peppers doesn't have uh, sorry, it doesn't have Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane on it because they recorded those first and put it out as a standalone single, which is what the Beatles did then and all bands at that time period, a lot of them did anyway, brought out standalone singles that then didn't appear on the album. So the great culture industry could push forward more product, probably. But sure, I'm sure we've all had a crack at making Sgt Pepper's a little bit better by adding Strawberry Fields in there and Penny Lane in there and getting rid of Good Morning and with him, without you. Some people will think that's a terrible thing to do. Or maybe now we don't have time limits, so we could put Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. Strawberry Fields maybe on side one, Penny Lane on side two. That 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 could work. So anyway, but we're talking about Pink Floyd. So there are two singles at the beginning. Arnold Lane, I think, 
is is rightly so a, a standalone single. It doesn't really fit on the album, even though it's brilliant about a transvestite uh, dressing up, stealing women's clothing from a clothing line. Uh, the whole uh, format of that song, the lyrical content, the way Barrett moves from one thing to another is fantastic. Um, but I guess See Emily Play, to me, has the same kind of production values and quintessential Englishness to it that the rest of the album, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, has. So, uh, yeah, just to talk briefly, obviously Sid Barrett was the leader of the group at that particular time before David Gilmour. And he really uh, brought a very unique, idiosyncratic, uh, quintessential Englishness, sense of English, even nursery rhyme sensibility to the lyric songwriting at that time, but also the way that he sang was incredibly English. Um, and at that time, it hadn't really been, there have certainly been, the, so if you think of early David Bowie and I think it's Anthony Newley or one of his major influences. Certainly the English voice or even the working class voice was certainly prevalent in popular song before then. But there's, uh, yeah, something uh, very, uh, I guess it, it's, the, it's, a, it's a different type of voice that Sid Barrett's using. I guess even a more educated type of voice. But certainly, yeah, I, I would put it that it's certainly not a working class voice. So it's a it's a literate voice in some ways. If we just look at the lyrics through a C. Emily play, uh, Emily tries but misunderstands. She's often inclined to borrow somebody's dreams till tomorrow. Soon after dark, Emily cries, gazing through trees in sorrow, hardly a sound till tomorrow. Yeah, very, very uh, akin to something that's come out of a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale. Um, and brilliantly evocative. Uh, Float on a river forever and ever. Very Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland um, sensibility going on there. Tapping into nature. I think it's interesting that, yeah, Pink Floyd were very much uh, from Cambridge University and the, the river being right near the university and the, the startling, uh, rustic, beautiful English countryside. Uh, that surrounds that university is very much evident in their music, especially later with Grandchester Meadows and some of the other songs. But it's certainly there in CM Lee play, Float on a River Forever and Ever. Um, and also there's an acid sensibility there too. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about drugs, but yeah, there's a very much schizoid uh, songwriting a bit, uh, thing in Sid Barrett's lyrics where he's on one tangent and goes to another tangent completely but somehow it's cohesive it, the, the thread isn't lost in the song uh, it's probably most spectacularly evident in uh, the song Bike which we'll get to so CM Lee play and again it has this instrumentation that I think is just incredible and still holds up today in the middle of the song or Early on, they just have a sudden, the song stops and there's this crazy piano that sounds like someone's opened an attic up and grandpa's in there just hammering away. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and then boom, boom, back into the guitar and the bass. Emily cries and misunderstands. Or, uh, um, yeah, so incredible. Rick Wright is very underrated as a member of Pink Floyd, full stop. But on those early albums, his contributions are just spectacular, marvellous, incredible. I should use more erudite words here, uh, but I'm trying to keep this more lowbrow, not getting it too highbrow. So I'm going to stick with those adjectives. But yeah, if you, uh, uh, Brian Wilson obviously with Pat Sounds was also doing a similar thing where he's making one instrument sound like another. And on Pipe at the Gates of Dawn, you can certainly hear, it's very hard to distinguish whether it's a piano or a guitar or a harpsichord or, especially with Rick Wright, his, his keyboards and pianos sound like something else completely a lot of the time. And Sid Barrett's use of slide guitar and echo is, is really sorry, prevalent and uh, was not, there wasn't a lot of that guitar sound going on at that particular time. There certainly was, they have been compared to Velvet Underground, which also came out at the same time. But, yeah, Roger Waters denies they'd even heard of the Velvet Underground at that time, and, and he may be true. Uh, Sid Barrett's guitar is quite different to Lou Reed, for instance, or Sterling Morrison. 
but there's a lot of use of echo and uh, detuning the strings which the Velvet Underground did too. Uh, so there is some crossover with that, but very different uh, sound and lyrical sensibility. Whereas uh, Lou Reed was very influenced by the American type of um, plain speaking, plain writing, Hemingway and so on. Barrett is very poetic, his language is very poetic. So looking at the album, the first track, Astronomy Domine, is, is yeah, a, an incredible opening track. I don't want to go through each of these tracks. But yeah, the, the, the glitches and the, the space uh, sort of feel that it has, similar to uh, Space Oddity a couple of years later that came on. Certainly Barrett was a big influence on David Bowie. And also Lime and Limpet Green, the second scene, the, the fight between the blue you once knew floating down, resound, resound the icy waters underground, Jupiter and Saturn. But I'm not going to go on because I'm going to make a botch of it. But anyway, incredible free-floating uh, poetic lyrics that do tap into something greater than, than the rational, uh, whatever they might mean on in a rational sensibility. So he's tapping into poetry, which is great um, because obviously opens up the mind and leads to more introspection, as some social theorists would, would argue too. Lucifer Sam, a great song. That's, I think, the song that's got that cat something I can't explain that just comes out of nowhere. And again, you know what he's talking about, but it just jumps into a song that seems to have nothing to do with cats. So, yeah, a great juxtaposition of different images, which again taps into the acid sensibility of the songwriting, where um, on and on, on when you take acid or mushrooms or any type of strong psychedelic, your, your focus is very short-lived, so you'll be obsessed with one idea or thinking you've found the answer to the meaning of life and then suddenly ah, something else has grabbed your attention and, and also the emotions swing around in an incredibly alarming manner where you're feeling incredible love and warmth for everyone then you're feeling incredibly alienated. And I think that's really prevalent in uh, the songs on these albums and also the two solo albums of Sid Barrett. So that sense of alienation builds and builds, but it's already here. But also the sense of wonder and awe and that you found out the meaning of the universe is um, on these songs. Matilda Mother is probably my favourite track, which I amazed I only found out recently. Rick Wright sings the verses on that, um, all the first two verses, I think. But across a, a great, incredible lyric, a uh, fairy tale lyric, um, and miraculous instrumentation. Again, these are super. I'm using superlatives here, hyperbole. But yeah, it's an extraordinary song. Um, fairy tales kept me high. It's cloud light, sunlight burst through the sky. I'm mucking this up, but basically, all those dolls' house darkness kept me high. It's clouds of sunlight floated by. I mean, it's extraordinary. Incredible lyrics. Then there's Flaming, which is a great riff, a uh, bass song, but also has some shouting and lyrical content. And Power Talk H is the first Roger Waters composition on a Pink Floyd album. And a lot of people, you know, point out its weaknesses, but it's okay. It fits in the album. It certainly doesn't destroy the, the running order. Sorry, uh, take, take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk um, is that track that I, I mentioned there, the Waters track. I, I'm, I could be wrong on that. God, I should do my research. I should know that. Anyway, one of those tracks, I think it's Take Up Thy Skip. Yeah, it sounds like a Waters track. That's the Waters track and Power Talk H is the instrumental, perhaps. Anyway, it has been a little while since I've listened to it. I should have done more homework. But Interstellar Overdrive. Um, yeah, I... Uh, Apparently, yeah, because they were playing at the UFO Club a lot at that time, uh, a lot of people said Norman Smith didn't capture the madness uh, and the innovation that that track had in the UFO where people were tripping and it was just this incredible... They used slides projected on them and, and against the walls and it was the ultimate psychedelic experience. And, of course, people like Pete Townsend and Paul McCartney would go there. So they had a pretty damn impressive audience to play to but 
Yeah, we, we, we won't know because we weren't there. So to me, Interstellar Overdrive fits well in the album. It's a long, long instrumental. Um, and again, you could have ambivalent feelings and think it's the kind of Revolution 9 of the album that sometimes you might want to skip it. Sometimes I feel that way. Other times I want to immerse myself in the soundscape and the incredible guitar playing and madness of that track, which would really come, they would really kind of, plough that field more on the second album but on this album this is the one track where it's the freak out track where it's largely instrumental it is all instrumental um so yeah that's the start of the second side and then we've got the gnome again uh nick mason in his book his autobiography or the book on the band has said that they were playing in some very working class suburb in london and they were pelting them with uh, coins and things and were very uh bellicose and didn't enjoy the performance at all and he said they're not the type it wasn't the type of audience who would like to be introduced to a gnome named grimble grumble or whatever it is um, so again it's whimsy it's very english it's english whimsy and uh that, that's probably the one track that i love when i was young and maybe now is a little bit twee but it's still look at the sky look at the river isn't it good that sense of that bucolic rustic sensibility of, of nature surrounding us is is really well done and Barrett had a great uh, ability to, to bring nature alive which again I think is connected to the amount of acid he's taking. Chapter 24 based on the I Ching so I think a lot of the lines were taken directly out of the Chinese Book of Wisdom the I Ching uh, all movement occurs in three moments or six movements the seventh is return something like that um that's a great track too beautiful harmonies at the end of it um and great keyboards from rick wright the scarecrow again meanders a little bit but there's a great clip on youtube of the band meandering through the english countryside on a beautiful sunny day which again uh the connection to nature that i i argue is very integral to sid barrett's music is is definitely in that clip and the scarecrow, of course, the scarecrow out in the field. Um, and again, Barrett was unique in writing a song about a scarecrow. That wasn't a musical type of song, like The Wizard of Oz. And then The Amazing Bike is the final track. So that's probably the, the greatest song on the album. And uh, yeah, I mean, I remember playing that to people when I was 15 drunkenly at some party and, and the, the person I was playing it to just going, this is a load of nonsense. And it is a lot, but it, it's brilliant nonsense. I've got a bike, you can ride it if you like. It's got a basket and bells and rings and things to make it look good. I give it to you if I could, but I borrowed it. I mean, yeah, here's a plate of gingerbread man, ginger here, ginger there, lots of gingerbread man. Take a couple if you wish, they're on the dish. Great alliteration and just the rhymes and and you're the kind of girl that fits into my world. I'll give you anything, anything if you want things. To me, that reeks of acid. That reeks of that psychedelic kind of ambivalence, but also that where your mind is moving along on a trajectory and then it suddenly goes to another trajectory. It's certainly not a love song, but the chorus suddenly switches into the connection with a girl or, or a person and saying, I'll give you anything if you want if you want things, the materialistic critique of uh, society and capitalist society, prevalent very much in the counterculture of the 60s, sort of seeps through to that. And then the end uh, where they will go into the room and they open up an attic and all these crazy sounds come and the kazoos come out. Yeah, it's a remarkable soundscape of, of different noises. And, and I've heard Roger Waters say that... Um, he uh, finds this early music difficult to listen to because they were just making strange sounds. And, and whereas the great architecture student that Waters was, like structure and knowing that everything he's doing has a purpose and a point and is building towards a, you know, a certain end, uh, whereas Barrett is much more free-flowing and uh, less calculating. Not to say that some of Waters' very calculated music later on doesn't, have emotional resonance it certainly does but there's something of the joy and wonder of being a child um uh, on that first album and those first two singles uh that is just spellbinding uh i think there's a great interview on uh, that you can see on youtube where the 
a very fusty, uh, no fun type of uh, critic, music critic. Uh, the name's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, he, he says, you know, this is a regression to childhood because Sid Barrett does the first song on the album, Astronome Domine, and he's like, Woo! and holding up his hands in this great outfit. And yeah, a regression to childhood. And he also says, um, why is it so loud? Why is the music so loud? Um, he's got a great German sounding name, I think. Ah, uh, someone, every people are probably shouting at the screen telling me who it is. Anyway, so that, the regression to childhood, certainly, I think that uh, the acid sensibility seeps through with this idea of going back to the past to find, I think acid rips your head off and takes away all sense of, of um, identity and uh, stability and having a place to stand is, is just washed away when, during the psychedelic acid experience, I've been told. Perhaps, maybe I know. Anyway, it's, yeah, that sense of, sense of home and no direction home, obviously in Like a Rolling Stone, is prevalent in this early music where there's a, an, a form of alienation and then a return to childhood that Barrett's very much toying with on these albums, which was obviously really going through his own mind because in less than a month or two after this album, he would be losing his mind. So he obviously was when this album was being made and a lot of the songs uh, talk about that warmness uh similar to uh proust in some ways that 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 wonder and the sense of safeness uh and stability that came from the, the childhood home uh and fairy tales and sitting in bed and being warm and someone reading you and you taken care of and you're not out in this alienated world where things are going hither and yon or, or moving about willy-nilly to use some English expressions. So, um, and yes, just we'll go, I'm gonna go just onto the, the next album here, Saucer Full of Secrets. Again, a slightly lesser work to Piper at the Gates of Dawn, but still very, very good. Um, and very, very different in some ways, but I think Norman Smith's production on this is very similar to the first album. So I reckon they're sim similar in some ways. Just obviously they don't, doesn't have the great lyrics of the first album. Uh, except on Jugland Blues. So Sid Barrett does apparently play guitar on some of Set the Controls to the Heart of the Sun in the background, but he's certainly very dominant and, and wrote Jugland Blues, the last track, which I'll, I'll probably start with that following on from the last album. So that really uh, articulates or illustrates what it is to have a nervous breakdown and to lose your mind in some ways. It's, it starts off, again, very um, arch Englishness, it's awfully considerate for you to think of me here. It's, I'm most obliged of you for making it clear I'm not here. Um, wonderful stuff. Uh, so he's basically saying almost a message to the rest of the band or his audience that, you know, I'm losing it and it's nice of you to recognise that I'm not here anymore and you've got a replacement waiting in the wings, David Gilmore, good old sensible, safe David. No weird wayward lyrics from him, but ah, uh, master on guitar and great singer, and ah, uh, he wrote some good songs too. I'm not going to dish on Dave. So um, Jugland Blues, a standout track, and the the last lines of the album and the song are, the seas and green, and I love the Queen, and what exactly is a dream, and what exactly is a joke, what exactly is a joke, very English. Uh, articulation, which I'm not going to imitate. Being an Australian. So the, the opening track, okay, so that's a great ending track, Equip up there with Bike. So this album is already, you know, not a throwaway album or something you can dismiss. But the first track too is incredible, Let There Be More Light. I think it's been said that that, that song inspired Hawkwind or many of the prog rock bands and a particular kind of space rock sound that developed after this album. So... Yeah, it's a whole, for, for a band to uh, come and start on their first album and invent a totally new sound is, is something in itself. And normally the second album will be, you know, going on and repeating the same formula. Uh, the Velvet Underground again, another band that also went in a completely different direction on their second album, White Light, White Heat. But we're talking about two remarkable bands and most bands, the second album's not too dissimilar to the first. So 
starting up on that track and again the the end part of the track too i love the 60s the late mid to late 60s sensibility in music where you'd think the song would end and then it would go on what you call an outro the beach boys were great at this but hendrix had it on a lot of his songs where the song would end and then there'd be this mad harpsichord bit or another part of a song uh which let there be light has and i'll talk more about this because it's a couple of stellar rick wright songs where or someone else wrote them, Julia Dream and um, Cirrus Minor, where there's just an outro of a Rick Wright organ piece where he plays on his own that is just incredible um, and gives the whole track a, another element to it. So, again, speaking of Rick Wright, remember a day and seesaw his two tracks. Now, some people have said that these tracks can send you to sleep um or sleep inducing i even he has been quite derogatory about these tracks saying they're so slow i i, I think remember a day is really good i think they're both very psychedelic in that they the instrumentation on them is completely crazy and uh has instruments sounding like other instruments pianos sounding like uh orchestras and and uh there's huge crescendos of sound and da -da 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 uh, beautiful kind of rises and falls in, in, in dynamics in those songs and the lyrics are a bit silly but in the psychedelic moment of the time that they do work and there's a longing to them uh, and an, again an Englishness to some of the the, the sound and the way that Rick Wright sings. Not, not the same as Barrett, but it's, it's not dissimilar. Now, we have Corporal Clegg. I'm going to get this over with. Um, I think this song is a stinker. I hate the kazoos at the end. Some people have said, oh, it's a wonderful early song that shows Waters' sensibility, songwriting sensibility that would come out in the later albums. Um, I disagree. I, I don't think Corporal Clegg is... Uh, well, I guess he's talking about the war and someone returning from the war. And again, you must remember Roger Waters' father was in the war. We'll never forget it because he mentions it every minute. So obviously early on, he's getting it in there. But I think Nick, Nick Mason sings the, 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 the vocals. It's awful. The awful song. Corporal, a novelty song. It's a type of song Adorno, the, the, the theorist, German theorist, would say is, is a novelty, an awful novelty song. Da, 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 da. Uh, again, you could say it's a little bit like Jugland Blues at the end, but uh, I would get rid of that song altogether. Now, um, the master, two masterpieces yet to come. So, "Set the Controls to the Heart of, for the Heart of the Sun" is the great first Roger Waters song. It's an amazing piece of music that obviously I think they bettered on on Amagama and on the Pompeii album that's now finally come out as an album so i'll mention that all the film but yeah that's a whole different sound with nick mason using the the what do you call them the timpani timpani sticks or using a timpani using the tom toms um, i'm looking for the word of the drum sticks with the fluffy bit on the end anyway mallets using mount perhaps mallets uh, anyway he does a it gives a great different sound and it's got a very eastern sound to it uh, with the, the, the harmony and the, the reverb that they use. And again, what a great title, Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun. An apocalyptic, sort of fatalistic, nihilistic. This is before punk music, people. Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, there you go. But also with a sort of sci-fi sensibility that maybe John Lydon wouldn't be too thrilled with. But anyway, um, that's a great, a great song on there. Uh, and Roger Waters' first great songwriting. Peace. Uh, and then we have the title track, The Source of Full of Secrets, which again, I, I didn't, I always loved the end section of it where the, the incredible choir comes up and Rick Wright's amazing keyboard organ. It's not an outro because it's a very integral part of the song, so it doesn't exist outside of the song. But that section, if you, it's almost a classical piece of music and it's got certain movements. But I've learned to love the whole thing. Maybe just from watching Pompeii so much. I think the Pompeii version's the best. Uh, the, the crazy bit with Roger Waters smashing cymbals and then hitting the gong and the sun, sunset happening at the same time and Gilmore 
just there with his big 70s sunnies on in the sand using the slide guitar there and the end section there's just incredible the build up of that the the Gilmore singing and that final choral piece um, so obviously it's in movement so Norman Smith the producer was very uh, underwhelmed with the song he really didn't think it was a song and Sid Barrett actually said that uh, the album they made without him sounded like something four architecture students would make. I think Gilmore wasn't an architecture, but certainly Mason and Waters were, and I think Richard Wright. So something very structured about it, whereas Barrett's music was very much from the id, straight from the unconscious, just barreled out of him. Whereas, uh, yeah, Waters sat down with a pad and they all sat down and wrote movement here, movement here. It's not flowing from the unconscious. It's very conscious, very structured. But having said that, uh, to me, I'll go out on a limb here and say there's something of a, a church service, a Catholic church service even. There's this sort of re release of tension and sins, a sort of confessional quality to the first part of the music with Roger Waters smashing a cymbal and... <laughs> getting rid of all the sins and the, the angst that you have in your life. Uh, and then this wonderful Gilmore sort of space guitar sound and there's this kind of breakdown where Mason's doing the drumming, it builds to a crescendo and then the priest says, all your sins are forgiven. And there's this wonderful, slow-moving Richard Wright organ piece that builds and builds and builds. Uh, and then the crescendo, the hallelujah, if you will, at the end, and, and you walk out of the church all with a sense of uh, release and uh, forgiveness. All your sins have been forgiven. All the gong, the gongs have been smashed. The cymbals have been hit. And, uh, yeah, so it's a journey. It's a journey. And apparently, yeah, John Peel said he heard them play this song. I think it was called, again, someone else, at The Unmasked Gadgets or Hercules or some ridiculous title. But they played it at Hyde Park. I think they played it early in, when, the, when the sun was coming up, one of those all-night gigs that tended to predominate around that time in the mid to late 60s. And John Peel said it was the best thing he'd ever heard, ever. Like just, And you can see the, it, it fitted. He said it fitted in perfectly with the dawn coming up and it all being outdoors in a field, uh, which again bolsters my argument that there's a lot of connection to nature, which is not talked about a lot with Pink Floyd, constantly seen as being either an outer space, space rock band, or talking about inner psychological uh, crises that happen with the wall and wish you were here and so on. But yeah, there's, nature is very prevalent. So um, yeah, again, you could imagine going to confession, maybe out in the field, priest outdoors, confessing your sins, smashing the cymbal, banging the gong, Richard Wright steps up with the organ and you, you just forgiven and walk out into the nature, into the day. The dawn's begun, a new dawn, very much a feeling of a new dawn if you watch the Pompeii. The Pompeii version is fantastic. I recommend you go onto YouTube if it's still up there and watch Pink Floyd at Pompeii doing a source full of secrets. So um, I will go on to the next albums in the next piece. But yeah, just basically those first two albums, source full of secrets, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and Emma C. Emily Play. Whoops, that was Arnold Lane and C. Emily Play. So quintessential English sensibility, a nursery nursery rhyme lyrics that also have a very much underlying uh, acid experience enveloped in them, uh, an enveloping acid sensibility. So there's that, there's nursery rhymes, there's acid, there's a feeling of alienation uh, that comes with it, taking acid and that feeling of wanting to return to the womb. Freud would say this is a regression, regression, so did that music critic, regression, childhood, regressing back to the womb, wanting to go back to the womb because life's too difficult or life's too alarming. Again, I could talk about Van Morrison Astral Weeks. When you have that hypersensitivity that acid brings about but also it's in your own nature, your genetic structure, that life is just too overwhelming because you're seeing everything. Uh, as William Blake said, when the, uh, what is it, the famous phrase, um, when the doors of perceptions are claims, we, you know, we see things as in their immensity. We see things in their brilliance. 
rather than the mundane, we, mundane, sheltered, very closeted way we look at life. Once the doors of perception are cleansed, we see this incredible, uh, vast, uh, breathing, all-encompassing nature around us in our everyday experience. And uh, certainly the wonder of life is very prevalent on these two albums, uh, connected to nursery rhymes, connected to the, the joy of being young, and infinite horizons that come about when you are young. There's certainly incredible uh, breakthrough in sound on these two albums uh, that's equivalent to Sgt. Pepper's and Magical Mystery Tour, which I also kind of put together, both made in that same year. So, yeah, I put these on par with those two Beatles albums. As uh, Obviously, the Beatles were had two great songwriters, and this time Waters was still getting there. So Rick Wright's songs do let down the second album a bit. But I think the instrumentation is just wonderful throughout, and the, the singles certainly bolster up that that uh, period of, of songwriting and recording. So, yes, get them if you haven't got them. Watch some of the clips on uh, YouTube. The Arnold Lane clip is amazing too. There's two different versions, but they're both, to me, like perfect art house, 1967 pop music clips uh, that... Yeah, unique of their time and ahead of their time and still stand up today. Uh, or you can get the double, both albums on this double album, which, yeah, you'd have to look in a secondhand record shop to get that. Called A Nice Pair. All right, well, next time I'll move on to the next albums, but I will finish up for now. So good day to you.